Come on. So what we're seeing is a bunch of camera shake that's been stabilized. That's so cool. It's the classic green screen problem of just like, all right, no one actually knows what it's gonna look like because they're just looking at this void of green. This as a concept is one of the craziest things I've seen. Are we finally taking a look at The Last mm -hmm. Airbender? Does this live up to the hype? Is this gonna be crazy? Thanks to Noom for sponsoring this video. Stick around to figure out how you can take your free Noom evaluation. Welcome back to Visual Effects Artists React. <laughs> this, is, this is a special episode because there's no guests. And what does that mean? Well, it means we get to let loose a little bit, you know? Today we're bringing back the bad in good and bad CGI, and we have a lot of really good stuff to go through. I'm ready. Let's get into it. <laughs> I always knew you return. Oh my god, are we finally taking a look at The Last mm -hmm. Airbender? So we've had a lot of requests to take a look at The Last Airbender. It's known as not being a very good movie, but more so it's known for just completely like disrespecting the original source material. So I wanted to jump in here and just see this and see what everybody's talking about. Does this live up to the hype? Is this going to be crazy? Let's, uh, let's take a look. Dude, this composition. Yeah, his framing. <laughs> like, I want to imply that he's short, so we're just gonna keep Seriously, him on the Seriously, what is up with this composition? This headroom. There's some things that really jump out to me. So when Aang <laughs> starts moving the wind there, it's comped around him, kind of. Like, you know, they cut him out and they put some behind him, they put some in front of him, but like, they, for some reason they made it the same color as the ground. Like, I, I kind of get it. Like, you know, it's dust, right? But is he an earthbender or an airbender, right? Like, why is his airbending the same color as the earthbending? So already right there, you're running into like a bit of a weird, like, visual motif that's not really being consistent. Yeah, that's that's kind of tough though, because it's like, what do you color wind? You just make it like white and misty, you know? Like treat it like the vapor trails off the edges of a, like a jet wing. If I was the director, and this is the shot that was given to me, here's what I'd say. First and foremost, you have all this dust, but you have zero actual debris. No leaves, no grass, mm. no plants, leaves. no chips. Leaves! Yeah, nothing outside of just literally brown smoke. Like, it doesn't even like feel like air. Secondly, it's not casting any sort of shadow. Like, that should be blocking things. Like, even, as you can see dust kicked up from people's feet that cast shadow on the ground, but this dust in the air isn't casting any shadow. And then also, literally no one is being blown around by the wind. Like, his robe doesn't move. The people around him, their robes don't move. Like, nothing gets blown by wind, and he's making a little tornado. Leaves would have done so much. And also, I agree. I see the reasoning behind coloring it the same as the ground. The problem is that it, you then can't see it, which is the initial problem to begin with. <laughs> All right, there's some fire. The fire doesn't look that bad. Uh, actually, I see some problems with it already. But like the fire simulation itself looks good. I think it's real fire in the bottom of the fire pit. But notice how there's just a tiny flame in the bottom, and there's a giant flame in the top, and like they didn't <laughs> like they didn't bother to connect the two. That's just straight up the bottom of the fire, and the top of the fire is a completely different size. Well, it's magic fire. Problem number two with the fire. There's zero light on the environment. You take the brightest spot of the fire, like that should be illuminating things. You pull up a real picture of like a fire jet that, that that's that big, especially an overcast day, it's gonna light up things around it. When it comes from like an effect standpoint, the difference between a sunny day and an overcast day, yeah. if you're actually going to like, you know, take a meter, you're gonna see there's way less light. So the moment you have a huge bright effect like this, you will see effects of the lighting in the environment. There's another issue that stands out to me, which just, it feels like a lack of reference here. There's no heat ripples from the, the fire. And heat ripples really aren't that hard to do. You can literally take the exact same fire element and use it for your heat ripples, but there's just zero. So the fire doesn't feel hot either. Heat ripples is what sells heat. So this is a, uh, we did four pieces based on the division, live action pieces. And yeah, that's all real right there. Those are real heat ripples, that's real fire, real lighting. Like, the heat ripples don't just distort, they also blur. Yeah, the heat ripples are a lot smaller scale and kind of sharp than you might expect. We also added some fire digitally, but because we had that real reference right there, we could really make it feel like it was embedded in the scene. And this is a fake shot right here. Yeah, Good. so all of the fire in that shot is fake. Which you did. I, I added them, yeah. <laughs> but so the fact that you went in and put the heat ripples, even if the heat ripples aren't perfect, the fact that they're there goes so much further to making this feel like it's a hot scene. The lighting in this alley is still closer to like that overcast look than, you know, indirect sun. 
And then of course the fire hits this rock here, which is another CG object, but it doesn't illuminate it at all. Oh my god, you're right. There's literally zero illumination on that rock. What technique do you use to have a flame object like this or a simulation cast light? Like how would you have done it back then? <laughs> well, you know? I did do it back then. Should we pull up my video? Hey! Oh yeah! <laughs> Sorry, Ryan, you've entered the roast zone. I know. Why do I keep doing this to myself? You've entered the dunk zone. So to answer your question, how would you create the lighting? Well, you could just literally manually add some orange to the ground. Or you can have the, you have the scene already tracked. You might as well render out some geometry on the ground and the wall and actually have a light source illuminate it. So you render out a lighting pass of the ground that you would then use in compositing. Just because they have the fire and it's bright and it looks like it's emitting light, that's really just a shader. It's not actually an emissive material. It's yeah. not actually emitting light. Yeah. So any sort of lighting in a scene is gonna have to be hacked into it. People will say, oh, it just looks too CG. And that's not really the problem. The problem is that it doesn't feel like it belongs. The simulation, pretty solid. The, yeah, the render, simulation's actually really pretty, pretty solid. Good. But the compositing of that render, not so solid. It's like, devoid of like all energy and excitement. I, <laughs> I, I just have no clue if this is supposed to be like a scary scene or a happy scene or a intense, I don't know. I came into this thinking that the effects were actually gonna be pretty solid and it was gonna be the filmmaking that was bad, but I think it's, everything isn't as good as I thought it might be. Yeah. I wanted to bring in this video because I thought this had some pretty good effects in it, but they're also kind of unique. Giants. Here we go. Wait, so is he big Double or back. small? <clears throat> He's regular size. The people are tiny. The, the water sims going on here like yeah. are, are pretty detailed. Like Especially this shot right or here you where you see, see the water going up his back and yeah. whatnot. They actually did have some sort of stand-in for his body in the, the water sim. This is like one of those classic green screen shoots where mm -hmm. it's really important to see what the final product is like going to be or like at least pre-visualize it a little, little bit better because you can tell that as they're lighting this, they kind of weren't totally sure how to handle a couple elements here. Like you have this weird highlight hitting his stomach, yet like the whole background is completely blocked off by these ships. It's the classic green screen problem of just like, all right, no one actually knows what it's gonna look like because they're just looking at this void of green. That includes the actor, but that also includes the cinematographer who's gonna have to basically order where the lights are gonna be. And then the VFX are decided upon later. Sometimes they make the decision to be like, you know what? We're gonna make our own lighting to make the shot look good, even though that's now different than the lighting for the actual subject on the green screen. That creates a disconnect, and that is where a lot of the, oh, it's just shot on a green screen type takes come from, you know? I mean, to me, that's like the biggest challenge with green screen is lighting your green screen element to match the scene it's eventually going to be composited into. Yeah. I guess we're a big fan of when we do green screens for like an element on our shoot, we do it in the spot if we can, where it'll eventually be composited into. That way the lighting all matches. So pro tip for any guys out there who without a budget and you want to do some green screen, do it outside. It's gonna look better. Yeah, just get the little uh, pop-up green screens and go Or get one of our blankets. Yeah. Oh, dude, yeah. Get a blank quarter digital that store. Lighting matches here. The sunlight hits them in the right direction. Yeah, actually, that's a good point. Mm. This is a very well-connected shot. They probably shot a lot of this movie just like they went out to the parking lot and they're like, all right, put the camera really low, staring up. Yeah. And that's the perspective of everyone else. No CG, great. But then they still put a whole sky in the background, but that's easy enough to do. Oh. Obi-Wan never told you what happened to your father. It's also hard to match like the aperture difference, yeah. you know? Cause it's like, he was in focus and they were kind of out of focus. And it, it definitely looks like they're trying to make it work, but it's one of those things that's just very difficult because to film all of those people at the correct scale, you would also need to film him using the same scale camera. One of the challenges of filming miniatures, especially when you have a big thing in the shot at the same time, is the smaller something gets, the shallower the depth of field gets. Like for, if you take macro photography, for example, you know how you can only get like a sliver of something in focus and everything goes really out of focus? Well, imagine you're filming a person that's a one inch tall person with a regular camera. Just think of how big that camera sensor is relative to the person. The bigger a camera sensor gets, the more out of focus the background and foreground will get. Basically, the shallower your depth of field can become. If you want that same effect and the person was six feet tall, well, your sensor would have to be 10 feet wide by like 10 feet tall, which would give you the correct depth of field now when you film a six foot tall person to make them look like they're one inch tall. But obviously the sensor of that size doesn't exist. So they're avoiding this whole like focus issue 
by just kind of shooting everything in deep focus. Deep focus is when everything is in focus. It's kind of made famous by Citizen Kane. That was kind of one of the first movies to come out just to be like all deep focus all the time. Warszawie byłeś najlepszy. Ich bin kein Meister. Let's take a look at something new. So it was come to my attention uh, actually on the Ooh. on our subreddit. One of the craziest things I've seen was posted. You make a film in one language and you want to put it into another language. How do you do that? Well, generally you dub it, you add subtitles, you do all that stuff. Hmm. However, obviously, as we know right now, there's a lot of fun AI stuff when it comes to redoing lip movements, facial expressions, all that stuff. This movie called The Champion is basically the first movie to use AI to visually redub the entire film into a new language. Dukan Stales, High Commandant. Those eyes. You can do anything, Commandant. So be it. Wow. Dude, that lip. Man, that is subtle, dude. That's really good. Isn't that freaking crazy? It's been kind, Meister. I'm not a champion. What do you think the technique is? like from a layman's perspective. So there is an AI called Wave 2 Lip, where it basically takes an audio waveform and makes the lips move. It's not that bad, but obviously it's pretty low res and it only does the lips. So this is why I would assume it's they're just doing like a more refined version of this. So what they're doing, it's one level deeper than what Wave to Lip is doing. Wave to Lip attempts to guess what the mouth shapes are going to look like. Whereas with this one, the way they do it is they take the actors and then they redub an English version, but it's being filmed with like three witness cameras. So that way they have a base for what it's supposed to look like when they're speaking. So they still have to do the laborious process of taking the entire film and redubbing it in English, but then using those cameras, they have like the data of what it looks like when they speak and then AI magic, blah, 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 and then final film. So it's not some random other person doing the lines on camera. It's the original actor, but they fed him the English lines that he was able to just say. Yeah, and he says that later in a studio after the film's finally like edited. And they, I think they applied to like the, like the final color graded footage. Hypothesis, you film it with three cameras, you then take that footage and project it onto a, a model that allows you to actually align it with the actor's rotation. And then from that point is where you would use uh, like some, some of that AI stuff to make the transfer of one performance onto the other. They could be using the 3D models for like the extreme angles, which you tend not to get very good results for when you just do a, like a basic deep fake process to them. I feel like it'd be way too labor intensive if you're constantly having to align 3D models. Yeah, and Mike Seymour made a point of saying that the process is very streamlined. And so they were able to do hundreds of shots and I feel like if they're having to do all of these 3D models of faces and alignment and stuff like that, that's the opposite of streamlined. This as a concept for me is one of the coolest, most positive, like actual tangible benefits we can start to see with visual AI. Of all the things you can use AI for, tricking people and faking things and blah, 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 it's like, how awesome would it be to like have a foreign language film that's now suddenly accessible to anyone or any language? Mm -hmm. Dude, I'd love to see this applied to the show Dark on Netflix. I know, yes. There's so much to look at and figure out and you're constantly like, what's going on? And then like you're reading the subtitles and you look up and you're like, what's going on? Yeah, <laughs> so, yeah you're right. It's, it's pretty cool. It's pretty neat. We've been very positive about the VFX on this show lately, and you've been asking us to really break down some bad VFX. So leave a comment down below with any examples that you thought are the worst VFX shots of all time. Charles. <laughs> Come on. So I love simple, clever visual effects. And the movie Logan has that when Professor X has a seizure and everybody starts going like, whoa, our brains are being melted. Patrick Stewart was like, you know, I know I'm supposed to be going crazy and losing it, but when you guys are just sitting here pointing a camera at me and I'm just going, Gah! like, he's like, it just doesn't hit. I'm not able to get into the, the headspace, you know? And he was like, all right, what do you want us to do? He's like, shake the camera. And then everyone's like, hmm, what if we shook the camera really hard and stabilize it afterwards? <laughs> So what we're seeing is a bunch of camera shake that's been stabilized. You see this all the time in actual stabilized footage. We're saying like there's a motion blur streak that goes but like the footage didn't move. You're like, where'd that come from? It just goes to show it's not about how crazy your simulations are. It's about your ideas 
and how they execute with the story. Shaking the camera and stabilizing it. That's all they did. That's an effect that you could do right now with your phone and like five minutes on the computer. It's that easy. Do you guys want to do a shot right now? Wait, wait. Is Sam, is Sam Professor X? Okay, here we go. All right, here, hold on. I gotta get Sam. I gotta get Sam his like injector. Here, I'm gonna use one altered clip too for the altered AI just so I can say something hilarious. I'm Professor X. Oh my gosh, I'm having a seizure. <laughs> go! go! <laughs> all, be all better. It's worth mentioning that when you do that effect, you need to have a camera that has global shutter. Oh yeah, otherwise you just get the jello. Rolling shutter is what it's called. Which most cameras, including red cameras, black magic cameras, our iPhones, they all have a non-global shutter. Some, some red cameras have global shutter. Most cameras have a CMOS sensor, which records from top down. So if you're spinning left and right, your image suddenly skews. So this reminds me of Top Gun and how they got the camera shake in that movie. Wait, what? The old Top Gun? Yeah, the original Top Gun movie <laughs> that came out in the 80s. They were filming miniatures of the jets flying by, and if they were just shooting it with the camera, they were missing out on all of that energy. And so they came up with this crazy, interesting camera rig. It was a drill. Oh, really? The way they got this was by taking a drill and taking a block of wood and putting it on a rod into the drill. But that block of wood was off center so that when it would spin, it would vibrate. It's the exact same mechanism that makes your video game controllers vibrate and rumble. Yeah, so th like this shot, for instance, it's just a, a suspended miniature <laughs> jet. Look at that. They're just spinning it. Yeah, like, that's, that's so it. Cool. Yeah, they just turn it on. It's literally a button to get camera shake in oh, that's camera. that's so cool. So Todd Vaziri shared that bit of knowledge. They could have done that for the Logan shot. As Maybe. opposed to just like Maybe. hitting the camera or just manually trying to shake it. Because yeah, to keep it that consistent, it's hard. The frequency of the shake is very hard to, to get as well. Yeah. And that's where this is coming in because it's a very high frequency shake. Dude, I love the idea of having to wrangle your camera. It's like, let's go. But seriously, think about like the Logan stuff. Like I see this from decades ago. I'm mm -hmm. like, hey, does anyone have a battery operated drill on standby? And it's like, yeah, it's like, cool, I'm taping it to my shoulder rig. It takes, what, five minutes to rig an equivalent version? The frequency of like handheld vibration and shaking it is one thing, but when you have something that can like uh, go above that, like the, yeah. the look, you, you can sense how different it looks. Would it have benefited from uh, like a drill? I, I think it actually probably would have made it just a little bit more intense. But I don't know, because the drill would have created a very consistent blur, but what I'm seeing here is the blur kind of flaring out and coming back to normal again, then kind of flaring out. And that inconsistency, I don't think is something that you would get from a drill mounted type rig. Unless we're going like, rear, 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 rear. Oh my God, you're totally right. That's exactly right. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's it, yeah, yeah. What's up everybody? I'm back to tell you about one of my favorite sponsors of this channel, Noom. As you know, I've been using Noom for months now and it has literally changed my life and how I approach food and exercise and everything. See, Noom is a science-based program, not a diet. It's not a fad diet, it's not a one-off. One of the main goals here is food tracking. So I track my food every day using their color code system. Green, yellow, and red. You know, you have a calorie budget and you're trying to fit within that. More green foods is better than more red foods. And just by tracking it every day helps me make those better decisions in my everyday life. Um, there's also really great programs. I just took a lesson today about social eating. You know, it's kind of hard to pass up on the extra dessert or pass up on the extra appetizer when you're sitting with a big group of people. So, so the lesson I took today was called Breaking the Habit. And they were teaching me a psych trick on how to approach social eating a little bit better. You know, when you're eating with a big group of people, they actually say that you eat 65% more than you would in a regular meal just because of the social factor. So one of the tricks they told me was to try to finish eating first or make sure you have your order planned ahead of time so you're not just giving into the peer pressure and eating what everybody else is eating. So just by being more aware, Noom has helped me make better decisions in my life. Um, as you guys have known over the last few months, I've lost upwards of 40 pounds just from Noom. So um, I'm still on it, but to be honest, I'm also not perfect. It's really hard to do it every single day and keep it going and logging your food. So one thing that brings me back to Noom time and time again is the support system. Uh, Jennifer has been an awesome life coach in Noom and helping me just kind of giving me articles and tips. Uh, but another big motivating factor is you guys. Um, since the last time we did this, I've had 
a handful of you guys come up to me in real life and say uh, they were inspired by Noom or they are now jumping into their weight loss journey because of what they've seen here. And that has been the biggest motivation for me. Keep it up for all of you guys that got started because of this. I promise to keep it up to keep you guys going. And if you haven't yet started, then you can click the link in below or go to noom.com slash corridor crew and take your free Noom evaluation. Just like in stocks and investing, I think weight loss and health is, there's no better time to start than right now. Uh, thanks to Noom for sponsoring this channel. It is one of my favorite sponsors. Um, I'm literally a Noom advocate after all of this stuff. So it's been a huge change in my life and I hope it helps you guys out too. Thanks for watching and uh, let's get back to the React episode. Man, that was, that was very fun. That was a lot of stuff to look at. Thanks for sticking around and watching this whole video to the very, very end. If you enjoyed these videos, don't forget to subscribe or head over to cordodigital.com where we got the extendo, extra long editions of this React show. Thanks. See you in the next one. Ha, ha, ha.